Thank you, David and Tracy. That line in that song goes along with uh, Sunday school this morning. Redeeming grace for Adam's race. We're either in Adam or in the second Adam. Praise God if you're in the second Adam. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you allow us to gather here on your day, on the Lord's day, that you would allow us to worship you, us fallen creatures, us stained by sin, that we can offer up worship to you that would be acceptable to you, not because of who we are, because, but because of who you are. Thank you for the grace for Adam's race. Thank you for the second Adam that you sent your son to redeem a people for you. I ask that you would send your spirit to be our teacher today, to help me as I proclaim your word to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will, if you're physically able, if you'll stand for the reading of the word of God, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to read from verses 7 through 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 7 through 11. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them, to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren, which came from Macedonia, supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the region of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. You guys can have a seat. Praise God for the reading of his word. We see Paul here serving the Corinthian believers in three things. Serving them in humility. Serving them in truth and serving them in love. So if you take notes or if you write in your Bible, write those three words out in the margin. Humility, truth, and love. We are living in George Orwell's 1984 today, it seems like. If y'all have ever read that book or watched a movie on it. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength is a big theme in that book. Humility, truth, and love are foreign to the world that we're living in today. Those things just don't go with today's world. Up is down, left is right, right is wrong. The world sees humility as what? They see it as weakness. They see the truth as what? Hate speech, right? Right? And love is whatever you want it to be, according to the definition of the world. The Antichrist culture that we live in values the opposite of those things. Values pride. Values lies. Values hatred. Puff out your chest. Say whatever it takes to get what you want. And affirm anything, even if it's a lie, just to get the approval of men. That's where we are today. Are we surprised at this at all? We shouldn't be if we know the word of God. The world fears anything. And they fear everything except what? God. The world fears what? Rejection. The world fears being canceled. The world serves itself. Self is the new God. But is it really the new God? It's always been the same God. Eve was deceived into what? The God of self. That you'll be like God, right? Adam, the same thing. Pride says, don't let anybody slight you. Right? That's what the world says. Humility says, 
No, nope, you slap me. I am far worse than anything anybody could possibly say about me. Somebody's gossiping about you. May not be true, but you're far worse than anything they would say. If we are honest. If we admit that we are the chief of sinners. The lie says what? I can believe whatever I want. As long as I'm true to myself. That's what the world screams today. Tr being true to yourself. Well, the truth says Jesus is the truth. That his word is the truth. That truth exists outside of me. As much as I want to say it, I'm not the standard. No, the word of God is the standard. Jesus is the standard. Hate says, I love me. And whatever pleases me is really love. Don't tell me who I can't love. Don't tell me what I can't love. I will love what I want to love. That's not love. That's idol worship. True love says, I will lay down my life for my friends. True love says, I will delay pleasure. True love says, I will seek the good of others. I will seek the glory of God. That is true love. True love is that Jesus Christ came and died for sinners. Though we were his enemies, he died for us. Now the servant of Christ, we want to mimic who Christ was. We want to mimic his character. We'll never do it in perfection. No, but we should strive, as Paul said, to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Christ served in humility. The king of kings should have been the one being served, but he served in humility. He served in truth, and he served in love. Let's look at verse 7 again. I'm going to read out of the New American Standard this time. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge. Paul's asking them, it seems like a silly question, doesn't it? Did I sin in humbling myself? That, that is kind of odd. But remember, this whole section, Paul is kind of playing up the sarcasm here. Saying these false prophets have come in, these false teachers, these wolves have come into you, Corinth. And they're talking all this trash about me. And in, now I've got to lay it on a little thick so that you'll understand how severe it is. So Corinth, was it a sin for me to humble myself? Is it a sin to do good? Sounds a little bit like the Lord Jesus asking the disciples, saying, what well, if your son asks you for a fish, would you give him a snake? kind of along those same lines it's it's a silly silly uh, premise no I didn't sin by humbling myself no if my son asked me for a fish I would not give him a snake that's silly but he they do it intentionally to get our attention they do it so that we'll pay attention to what their point is that they're trying to get across or when Jesus said to the Pharisees on the Sabbath. Is it a sin to do good on the Sabbath? By no means. Obviously, no, it's not a sin to humble myself. I humbled myself, Paul says, to pick you up. I preached the gospel of grace to you. I didn't charge you for it. These false brothers are coming in, they're trying to make money off of you. But just for argument's sake, would it have been a sin if Paul had taken money from Corinth? No. Some do preach out of the love of money or for gain or for power, but was this Paul? No. Some famous, famous preacher will accept a speaking engagement. There's a list. There's a, an organization that does this. Only if your church is so big only if you have so many people in attendance or your conference or whatever you've got going on only if you give them five to ten thousand dollars to make this appearance or ten to twenty thousand dollars to make this appearance 
Some preachers will say that. They'll say, I'll only come to your church if you do those things and if you only have green M&Ms in the green room. Was this Paul? No. Paul, was he trying to get rich off the Corinthians? Well, if he was trying that, he failed, didn't he? If that was his goal, then he's a failure. That's what the wolves were accusing him of doing. They were saying, no, Paul's just trying to get you guys. He's just trying to make money off y'all. Now, let me ask you, if I write a book, is it wrong for me to charge for that book? If I make a movie, is it wrong for me to charge admission to go to that movie? If I write a play, is it wrong for me to charge admission to that play? No. Is preaching any different than those things? Well, I'll say, yes, it is different than those things. But no, a laborer is worthy of his wages, right? You know, I would love for us at Bass Chapel to be able to meet all of Pastor Dave's financial needs so that he doesn't have to lay brick for a living. I mean, wouldn't that be great if we could have a full-time pastor so that he could spend 40 hours a week praying for the saints here and studying the Word of God to feed us on Sundays and to feed us on Wednesdays. That should be something that we're praying about as a church, that God would allow that to happen. Maybe one day that'll happen. Maybe it won't happen one day. There are a lot of faithful bivocational pastors out there, and praise God we've got one. We should be praying for that, though. Is it wrong, though, to accept money for serving God? Well, let's check with the Levites. Back in the Old Testament, they went, and they were to be taken care of out of what? Out of the taxes in Israel. They were the servants of God for Israel, taking care of the temple, the tabernacle before that, out of the taxes of Israel, the tithes, they were to be taken care of on behalf of the people. They were to minister to God and minister to the people. Well, let's ask Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says, The elders who lead well are to be considered worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor at preaching the word and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. The worker is worthy of his pay. Acts 18 specifically tells us about Paul coming here to Corinth where we're at and not taking money. Verses 1 through 3 in Acts 18 says, After these things he departed Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, and his wife Priscilla, who recently came from Italy because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he was staying with them. And what? It says, they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. So, Paul was fine to take money if if that would have been the occasion. But, because he didn't want to be a stumbling block to the gospel, to them in Corinth, what did he do? He worked making tents. Corinth, because he didn't want to be a stumbling block to you. He could have been spending more time preaching, more time studying, more time evangelizing, but he spent time making tents so that he wouldn't be a stumbling block to you. Let's go back to our text. Verse 8. I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. So Paul says he robbed other churches. It's very popular to take verses and texts out of context. So if you ever want to just share a verse with somebody out of context, just say, Paul said he robbed churches. That was it. But does Paul mean that he broke the Eighth Commandment and stole from churches? No. He's meaning that other churches used money that could have been spent on ministry elsewhere to send him money for support while Paul was preaching in Corinth. 
Corinth, these wolves say I've taken from you. That's a fallacious claim. You know me, Corinth. You know I didn't take a nickel from you. I was being supported by Macedonia while I was preaching to you. You know I didn't take from you. Even though I had the right. I had the right. I humbled myself. I humbled myself to lift you up, Corinth. Did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. Verse 9. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. I in no way wanted to discredit the gospel is what Paul said. I didn't want to be a burden to you so that you wouldn't be looking at your billfold, but you would be looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want you to be looking at me and what you're giving me. I want you to be looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to be burdened by me. So much so, what? That when he was with you, Corinth, Macedonia was supporting him to keep him from being a burden to you. Macedonia not only supported me, but they fully supplied my need. Fully supplied his need. Praise God for that. That is mission sending. Some people go, uh, some people send. But if you're a Christian, you're doing one or the other. You're either sending or you're going. This is humility. This is Paul humbling himself. Back to Macedonia. Paul mentions in Philippians chapter 4 that the believers at Philippi sent him a gift more than once when he was where? When he was in Thessalonica. Where is Thessalonica? It's in Macedonia. These books, they're not just individual letters meant to be taken and cut up in to individuals but they all interact with each other reading the epistles along with the acts of the apostles reading those together it's all that one story interweaving around Philippians 4 Thessalonica remember that is in Macedonia we see how important supporting missionaries is right here Philippi supports Paul when he's in Thessalonica. Thessalonica supports Paul when he's where? In Corinth. And we had just talked about Paul just a couple of chapters earlier is talking about Macedonia and Corinth supporting ministry in where? In Jerusalem. Back to the original. You know, we are here in America, the ends of the earth. From where? Christianity in Jerusalem, we're about as far away as you can get from that. We are the ends of the earth. But who is the greatest missionary sending nation ever in terms of numbers? It's us. It's America. It's North America sending more missionaries than anybody ever. That is the ends of the earth sending them back, just like what's happening here. Jerusalem sent them out to Asia and to Europe. And what happened? Macedonia, Corinth, sending mission work back to Jerusalem. There are missionaries in Jerusalem right now sharing the gospel, sharing it out of Isaiah chapter 53 to the Jewish people there that don't believe. Missions goes both ways. You know who's going to be overtaking North America regarding missions? It's going to be Africa. Africa is, if things go the way they're going, Africa is going to be sending more missionaries than North America very soon. 
you play a role in the spread of the gospel every time you put money in the offering plate. You might not be called to go, but you're called to send. You send what? We watched a video between service, between Sunday school and service this morning, Phillips Family Ministries. Um, that's on our Facebook page if you haven't seen it. Go look there and see Daniel in Bangkok, Thailand, talking about how much it meant to him that we helped send him there. You send new vision to different parts of the world. All to the glory of God. Paul didn't want money to be a stumbling block to those new believers there. But now, guess what? They are, or at least they should be maturing in Corinth. They should be growing up. This is 2 Corinthians, and we've talked before, this is actually his fourth letter to Corinth. You got four letters from Paul. I'm hoping you're maturing a little bit. He, now with his affections for Corinth, his vested interest in Corinth, his godly jealousy for Corinth, he will lay it all out there and he's going to tell them exactly what's going on, saying you guys should be maturing by now. He's letting Corinth see how, what? The sausage gets made. We don't want to know how the sausage gets made. We just want to know that it shows up on our table cooked, right? Corinth didn't want to see how it got made. But Paul's saying, I was in the room when it happened. I was there when it happened. When he was in Corinth at the birth of the church there. I was there, he's saying. He shielded Corinth from the gruesome details that they didn't need to know at the time, but guess what? Now he's showing them how that sausage got made, how it got put on their table. He's letting them know that he was there for the glory of God, for their good, and how he protected them. All to the glory of God. Paul humbled himself. He took a burden upon himself that he, didn't, he wasn't required to take. Was it a sin for me, Corinth, to humble myself? To lift you up, to exalt you, Corinth. He who exalts himself, what? Will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Those are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is just following in his footsteps. He's humbling himself to pick up Corinth. God resists the proud. God opposes the proud. But what does he do to the humble? He gives grace. He gives grace to the humble. How do you humble yourself to pick others up? How do you go out of your way to not burden others? How have you been picked up by a brother humbling himself or burdening himself to lift you up? It happens. That's what Christian brothers and sisters do. Let's look to Paul. Let's imitate Paul What? as he imitates Christ. Let's look no further than the Lord Jesus three chapters earlier. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's it. Jesus made himself poor. He humbled himself. The second member of the triune God of the universe, the centerpiece of heaven, the one when Isaiah saw his robes filled the temple. This very one, the object of worship, humbled himself. He stepped out of heaven. He wrapped on human flesh. Paul is just mimicking his master, and that's what we should be doing. Let's keep looking to Christ Let's keep trusting in Christ. You can't help but be humbled when you're looking at the perfect man, the God-man. When we're focusing on self, when we're looking at others, we're going to find somebody that will make us puff our chest out. Some of us have to look a little harder than others. But the thing is, when we're looking at Christ, we will be humbled. When we are focused on Him, our pride cannot stand. Back to verse 10. 
As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the region of Achaia. Remember, Achaia is just the general area around Corinth. So Paul says he won't be silenced. He's preaching, he's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that will not be silenced. The truth will not be silenced. Not just in the city of Corinth, but the whole region. Paul's not satisfied with Corinth being Christ. He said, no, I want the whole region. Achaia, I want all of Achaia to belong to Christ. Paul says in Romans 9, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. Paul always serves in the truth. Why? Because he's imitating the truth. He's imitating Jesus Christ. He serves in the truth because he serves truth incarnate, Jesus Christ. He serves truth incarnate. Why and how? Why? Because truth incarnate had an encounter with him on the road to Damascus. And how? He serves truth incarnate by proclaiming truth incarnate. He serves Jesus Christ by proclaiming Jesus Christ. That's how it works. The truth cannot be stopped. It will not be stopped. Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Paul is a slave to the truth. Are we slaves to the truth? Jesus said to Pilate, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate's famous response was, What is truth? The false brothers here in Corinth, they were more akin to Pilate than they were to Christ. They were coming in, speaking ill of Paul, tainting and tarnishing the gospel, taking away from who Christ was, adding to the gospel. No. They were more like Pilate. Paul knew the truth. The truth is that there were people of the truth, namely those whom God foreknew, before creation that there were people of the truth who didn't know they were of the truth yet Paul knew it he said no there are people in Corinth there are people in Achaia Paul knew it he knew they were there and they he knew that they would hear Christ's voice the gospel and what would that do the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That there were people of the truth in all of Achaia and they would hear Christ's voice. But guess what? There are people of the truth here in Sergornsville and they will hear Christ's voice. There are people of the truth in Rogersville and in Kingsport and Johnson City and there are people of the truth in Laos and in the Philippines and California. Yes. As hard as that is for you to believe, there are people of the truth in California too. And they will hear Christ's voice and they will be awakened and they will be made new creatures. The question is, who will Christ use as his mouthpiece? Who will unapologetically proclaim the truth in this darkened world? Who will be undone by the glory of Christ? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who will say, here I am, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me to my family. Send me to my co-workers. Send me to Walmart. Do the people you work with or go to school with or come into contact with, do they know the glories of Christ? Do they even know you're a Christian? Here I am, Lord, send me. Are you humbled by looking to Christ? Are you motivated to love the truth by looking to Christ. That is our only motivation. 
We don't love the truth in order to get to Christ. No, he supernaturally made us new creations through his Holy Spirit by the predetermined plan before time began and he awakens us in time. He turns us from God haters into God lovers. He turns us from enemies into friends. Are you motivated? That is our motivation. Not to earn God's favor, but because we have been granted it through free grace, through faith alone. Are you motivated to love others and to love the glory of God? The truth will set you free. Are you free? Or are you in bondage to sin? Are you in bondage to the most wicked taskmaster there is? Yourself. Freedom comes by being a slave to the truth. That sounds crazy to the world. You can't be free if you're a slave. No, you have to admit you're a slave to sin to become free. You must be set free by Christ. Then you will be a slave to Him. The most benevolent master that the universe has ever known. Freedom comes by being a slave to the truth, to Christ. The world claims they're free. They don't know what freedom is. The only freedom is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Back to our text. Verse 11 says, why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. So right here, Paul's saying, why? The truth. I'm humbling myself. I didn't take money from you. The truth won't be stopped. Why won't it be stopped? Why is Paul motivated to preach the truth in all of Achaia? Why is he motivated to eventually get to Rome? As he told us in Romans, on his way to Spain. We know he didn't get to Spain. But why was he motivated to go to the ends of the earth? He was motivated by the love of his master. Because... Truth in the flesh is love in the flesh. God is love. Jesus Christ is truth personified. And he is love personified. Speaking the truth in love. That's what Ephesians 4.15 says. There is no love apart from the truth. If you lovingly proclaim a lie, you are not loving. You hate that person with all your heart if you just lovingly proclaim a lie. The world has a false view of love. They'll say that love is love. No, love is hate when it's based on a lie. The love that they speak of is hatred of God. When there's hatred of God, there is no worship of God. There is only worship of self. We should lovingly speak the truth. We should speak the truth from a loving heart. That we should love God enough that we don't water down His truth. That we should love that person enough that we actually care whether they believe the truth or not because we know if they don't turn to the truth, they're going to go to hell forever and ever where there is no end. There is no relief. Yeah, we should lovingly speak the truth, but that doesn't mean watering down the truth. We should do it from a loving heart, from a motivated heart that cares about the glory of God. Didn't Paul do this? He spoke the truth to Corinth no matter how hard it was. It was not easy for him to send these letters to Corinth. It was not easy for him to call out their sin like he did in 1 Corinthians. It wasn't easy for him to call them out and say, you're listening to these false teachers like he did in 2 Corinthians. It wasn't easy for him to send the severe letter that we've referenced before to hammer down on them. Because sometimes we need the hammer laid down on us. When we're believing lies, we need the truth to thump us a little bit. For the glory of Christ.
that false view of love that the world has. No, that's not love, that's hate. Don't confuse lust with love. Don't confuse pleasing people with pleasing God. If I'm pleasing God, people are going to hate me. Make sure they're hating us because of Him and not because of ourselves. Bowing down to the popular notion of the day is hatred. To withhold the truth from somebody is hatred. Have y'all ever heard of Penn and Teller, the magician comedians? Penn Jillette is a diehard atheist. But he said, how much do you have to hate somebody to think that they're going to go to hell and not warn them and not try to warn them of this? Penn Jillette is lost as a goose, but his general grace from God hopefully would convict us. How much do you have to hate somebody to not warn them of hell if you think it's real? Maybe we don't think it's real. Maybe we just have become so lackadaisical in our thinking. Maybe we have become so consumed with self that we don't even think it's real anymore. Don't proclaim the truth just to win an argument. Just to have a gotcha moment. That's not preaching the truth in love. That's saying, I love me, and I know some truth, so I'm going to lay that truth out there so that I got you, so you ain't got a response. And now people think, I'm really, really smart because I shut you up. That's not love. That is hate. To, and you're abusing the truth when we do that. There is no doubt about it. He did wound them. Paul wounded them. But he wounded them with the truth of the gospel from a perspective of that agape love that we talked about, that godly love that had been planted in him by our great God, that agape love, that godly love that has been planted in you if you're born again. Do you love your family enough to confront them in their sin? Do you love that stranger enough to warn them of the wrath to come? Back to verse 11. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. <clears throat> now, how does Paul phrase that? He says, it sounds kind of odd. Why? Because I do not love you? That's not what I'm going to tell my wife tomorrow on Valentine's Day or today or any other day. It's like, it's not that I do not love you. That would sound kind of odd, wouldn't it? But Paul phrases it that way in the negative to emphasize his point. We've seen this before. He said, he doesn't say I'm proud of the gospel. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It emphasizes what he's trying to say to get his point across. He uses that negative wording. He could have just said, I'm proud of the gospel. Same point. But no, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Same thing. But it gives that greater emphasis. It's memorable. You might say, if you're talking to somebody and they make a good point, you'll say, well, you're not wrong. That's pretty common these days. It's just an emphasis, a way of emphasizing yeah, I agree with what you said. Yeah, that's right. And But instead of saying that's right, you're saying, well, you're not wrong. It's giving that emphasis. That's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. He's phrasing it that way. He could have just said, I love you. But it wouldn't have held their attention as much he wouldn't have gone across the same way it would mean the same thing but he forces his reader to ponder that question he's saying do I not love you you know I do the answer is yes yes Corinth you know that I love you I've humbled myself for you Corinth I've proclaimed the truth to you Corinth I've taken no money from you, Corinth. I've wept over you, Corinth. I've sweated over you, Corinth. I've been insulted for you, Corinth. Yes, I love you. You know I love you. Why? 
because I do not love you? You know I love you, Corinth. It's just more emphatic. God knows I love you. God knows I do. Paul's not taking the Lord's name in vain here. A lot of, pe- a lot of times people will use that phraseology and they're really blaspheming God. Somebody was saying, you know, how's the weather going to be tomorrow? Somebody was saying, Lord knows. They're not really talking about the omniscience of God there. They're just using it as a catchphrase. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Lord knows. No, that is blaspheming God. Paul is not doing that here. He said, God knows I do. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows that I do love you. He's not just throwing God's name around here. He's not using it in vain. He's not using it willy-nilly. He's making sure Corinth understands that he loves them. And he says, God knows that I love you. God knows his motivation of his letters. God knows his motivation of his preaching. God knows his motivation in all that he has done for Corinth to the glory of God. God knows the motivation because God is the motivation. God's glory is Paul's greatest love. God's glory in all things. He had told the same congregation in 1 Corinthians, say, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That encompasses everything. And Paul lived it. He lived to the glory of God. God's glory should be our prime concern. God's glory. The love of the one who rescued him. That was Paul's prime glory. Is that ours? The love of the one who redeemed him. Is that ours? The love of the triune God. That was Paul's first concern. Paul loved Corinth. He did. God knows, according to verse 11. God knows I do. God knows that Paul loves God first and foremost. His entire life after his encounter on that Damascus road with the Lord Jesus Christ, after that, it was the love of God. Before that, it was really a pseudo love. It was a false love. He thought he loved God before then. He tried to do everything he could as a Pharisee. But none of it would earn one iota with God. It was the work of Jesus Christ that earned God's favor for Paul and for us. Let's trust in him. Let's rest in him. You love God, why? Only because God loves you. His grace enables Saul to love the ones that he once persecuted. His grace enables those whom he persecuted to return that love to Saul. He loved the church in Corinth who had betrayed him, right? They betrayed him. They were listening to these people talking trash about him, but guess what? He loved them. God's grace enables that. God's grace enables you to love someone who has betrayed you. God's grace enables us to love the unlovable. Why? Because it means that God loves the unlovable. Namely me. Namely us. There is nothing lovable in me. No matter what my wife tries to tell you. There is absolutely nothing lovable in me. Yet he loved me anyway. He gave himself up for me anyway. While we were still sinners. While we were enemies of God. He chose me not because I was better. Not because I was prettier. Not because I was smarter. Not because I was stronger. He chose me so he could display his grace. And his mercy. And his glory. And the same thing is for you. He didn't choose you because you're better. No, he chose you so he could show off his glory. He chooses you for his own glory. God knows I do, right? Why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. God knows what's in a man. 
God knows the wickedness that is in a man, but God also knows when he regenerates a heart, what he puts there, what he plants there, what he planted in Paul, what he plants in you when you're born again. Humility, truth, and love. Have you failed to be humble? I have. Have you failed to be truthful? I have. Have you failed to be loving? I have. That's pretty depressing. If that's what gets us to heaven. If that's what earns God's favor. We should all be very depressed right now. But that's not what gets us there. That's not what earns God's favor. It's the fact that Christ Jesus perfectly humbled himself. Christ Jesus was perfectly truthful. That Christ Jesus was perfectly loving. You have not in your life for five minutes been perfectly loving. Yet Jesus Christ, for his entire life, was perfectly loving. Humbling himself, perfectly truthful. Humbling himself by becoming a man. He wasn't just a man, he was the man. The epitome of what a man should be. He was the God-man. Though he was perfect in every way, he served instead of serving. When we are proud, he humbled himself on our behalf. When we are liars, he was truthful on our behalf. When we are unloving, when we are hateful, he was loving on our behalf. Praise God. When you look at the mirror of the law, you see your failure. You see those commandments that, wow, I have not glorified God as I should. I have not worshipped Him as I should. I have used His name vainly. I have lied. I have stolen. I have committed murder. I have lusted in my heart and committed adultery in the eyes of God. When we look at that mirror, we see our failures. And we can do one of two things. We can go into a deep, dark depression because we don't live up to the standard of God. Or as a Christian, as someone who has been born again, someone who has been supernaturally changed by God, we can look at our failures and say, Praise God, Jesus succeeded. Praise God, He told the truth. Praise God, he glorified God to the maximum his entire life. And guess what? His sacrifice on that cross was accepted. Why? Because we know he rose on the third day. If he didn't do all those things, then he's still dead in the ground being eaten by worms. But we know that he rose on the third day. That is proof that he did it. He did it. He succeeded where I failed. Look to Christ. You see the humble truth staring you back in the face. You see love himself. Whenever you dwell on the cross of Christ, stop trusting in your own ability. Stop trusting in your own humility. Stop trusting in your own ability to love and to be truthful. It's all tainted. It's all dirty. It's all filthy. But Christ's is perfect. Perfectly clean. Perfectly righteous. You fail the test. I fail the test. Christ always passed the test. Christ kept the law for the unlawful. Christ is better than anything you can come up with. He is the only one. The only one. The only one worthy of praise and worship. We talked about if Adam in Sunday school this morning... If Adam had succeeded, we'd be singing the praises of Adam today. Adam, you did a great job keeping that one law. No, Adam failed at that one law. And that was by plan. So that we would be singing the praises of Jesus Christ this morning and for all of eternity. Because we're going to be looking to Him for our righteousness, not at ourselves. We're not going to be looking at Adam. We're not going to be looking at our parents. We're not going to be looking at our grandma or our aunt. As wonderful as those people may have been, 
They're all wicked sinners, just like me and just like you. Look to Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending the perfect one. Thank you for sending your son into this world that he humbled himself by becoming a man, becoming like one of us, becoming like one of his creatures. We praise you that he was always truthful, that he was always loving. Lord, help us to mimic that, not because it earns anything with you. We don't get brownie points for that. No, because Christ was obedient on our behalf. Help help us as we go through our day and our week to dwell on your Son, Lord. Help us to sing his praises and to make him known. But when we fail, know that we have an advocate with you, Jesus Christ the righteous. I ask that you would be with our day and bring us back here tonight at 6 o'clock and to help us come back with a heart prepared to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.